Kids who like to make things and play in the dirt may grow up to build the infrastructure of the world, often using the equipment designed and manufactured by an industry-leading company based in Midwestern Illinois. James W. Owens, chair of Caterpillar Incorporated, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Jim Owens, growing up in coastal North Carolina, investigated four home state universities and chose North Carolina State for his education. Thanks for being here, Jim. My pleasure, Larry. Now, when you went to North Carolina State, you were there eight years with an interesting progression of degrees. Bachelor's, Master's in Textile Technologies and then the PhD in Economics. Right. Were you planning a career in textiles or was the, the PhD always the end goal? Well, you know, coming out of high school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Uh, the textile industry at the time was the leading industry in North Carolina. They actually went out and recruited uh, students that had a bit of a math science bent to come to the textile school, which was one of the three largest textile schools in the world. So it's kind of a, an industrial engineering geared to the textile industry type program. Uh, as I progressed through that master's degree, particularly, uh, took a lot of operations research, statistics, a fair bit of economics, but economics became my kind of academic love uh, and late in my undergraduate curriculum. And I really kind of wanted to pursue an MBA, and quite frankly, I had full scholarships and research grants to stay and get a master's degree. So during the master's degree, I really slanted my education towards the economics and statistics. And then it was pretty easy to make the decision to stay another two years, uh, not just for the sports, as some might have guessed, but to get the doctorate in economics. And, uh, now, when I think about PhDs in economics, I usually see people working in think tanks in big urban cities, academia, maybe government. How'd you wind up working with Caterpillar in Midwest Illinois? Well, I, quite frankly, I mean, the, the PhD program in economics at NC State at the time was really an exceptional program. We had a great faculty from really young guns from the University of Chicago, so we used to call it University of Chicago South. Uh, very market oriented, I think a great education and intensely competitive. But I always knew I didn't, I, I wanted to work in industry and I wanted to apply uh, the economic principles in a business setting. Uh, I had a couple of very interesting job offers that I was leaning to take and I was just trying to get the degree finished. Uh, when Caterpillar actually came to campus, the chief economist for Caterpillar looked through a book of resumes, picked my resume out because of my business interest and asked for a two-hour interview, which I, quite frankly, almost reluctantly went to because I had other things to do. But the dean asked me to do it because he was a friend of uh, Don Paris, who was our chief economist at the time. At any rate, Don did a heck of a job of selling the company, uh, of explaining how I could use my academic training, econometric statistics to uh, real-world application at Caterpillar. Caterpillar was one of the few large companies that had actually a professional economics team. Interestingly enough, my uh, initial job offer, which was a pretty attractive offer, obviously, because I went there, included a letter that said, if you don't finish the dissertation and receive your degree within the first year, you'll be terminated. Ooh. So they were serious about the degree, and I was serious about finishing it, having gone through all the blood and sweat to get that far. Uh, so it was a good marriage, a great company. My first three years there as an economist, I got to work with a lot of the senior executives writing uh, you know, white papers, position papers that, on economic policy that you know, they did a lot of uh, 
work with the government at the time. And we were increasingly, even then, thinking of being a global company. But, but then three years later, you got some global experience. You, yeah. you went to become, uh, you went to Geneva, Switzerland to work for Caterpillar Overseas. Yeah, that was part of the carrot, actually, in the beginning, is if you come and things work out really well, um, you could perhaps become our chief economist in, in the European theater. How important is it for, that's a, that's a young age, you get an overseas assignment. How important is it for young up and coming leaders to get some overseas experience and see how the world works? Yeah, well, I probably wasn't sophisticated enough to think all the way out at the time. I thought living in Geneva, Switzerland would be a pretty neat deal. And I did think it would be a fabulous opportunity to learn and, and learn about uh, uh, how the economies functioned in Europe. I, I, you know, as I got there and I got into it, it was a fabulous uh, learning opportunity because I had the opportunity to work with governments and senior business leaders and Caterpillar dealers from Johannesburg in, in South Africa all the way to Moscow. And of course, all these economic environments were quite different, different forms of government. I had opportunities to interface with senior government people to work with our manufacturing operations all over the theater and our marketing groups. So it was a great learning time. Now, I remember from my corporate life that sometimes young executives would take overseas assignments and then they'd promptly drop off the radar screen to the people back at world headquarters and kind of get lost in the system. How do you counter that? Well, not true at Caterpillar. Uh, in fact, we have an expectation that uh, people that are s going to be senior leaders in Caterpillar will have international experience. And that doesn't mean traveling through, that means living and working in an international environment. Because we recognized, and our leaders had recognized already when I joined the company, that being successful in the global marketplace was critically important to our leadership position. Now, you moved around a lot in the company, so another overseas uh, jaunt in Indonesia. And over the time, you've led something like 13 of the 25 divisions in different categories. A guest on the show last year, Mark Bertolini, who's president of Aetna, said that leaders have to learn how to be different leaders in different conditions and different situations. They can't be a one-trick pony leader. As you were moving around in all these different situations, did you find that exciting or did you find that a little nerve-wracking? Oh, I found it very exciting, and uh, I think you get to learn uh, a, a lot of things in every different situation because the situations are different. I, I think there are basic leadership principles, uh, certainly uh, a values-based, uh, high-integrity leadership style and an inclusive style that really focus on, on developing teamwork that are kind of universal truisms. And no matter which of these jobs I had, I think I brought those principles with me. Uh, you have to learn how to tap the talent that's there and to get it working well together as a team to get the great results that you, you hope to achieve. And I think you have to look at each job as if it was your last job and to do it with, uh, do it uncommonly well and to think of yourself as a steward for a while to really elevate the game and, and to take that piece of the business at least or that division or that department or whatever to a new level. Fast forward to 2004, you got to be steward for the company, right, as, as, as CEO. For those of us, give us a real short thumbnail sketch of what is Caterpillar, uh, the, the business, the scope, the size. Most of us only see the machines at a construction site. Yeah, most people know Caterpillar from its uh, yellow construction equipment. You see it by the roadway, and we're proudly. Uh, we help enable transportation around the world by building those roads all over the world. Uh, Caterpillar is, uh, you know, we have a, a very large construction equipment product line, construction equipment mining that goes everything, everything from a small skid steer loader that would be used for lawn and guarding type applications to a 400 ton mining truck in price from about 30,000 at the low end to 6 million a piece for the big trucks. Uh, engines, everything from about 50 horsepower up to 5,000 horsepower, powering everything from a a very small uh, gen set that would run lights on a field to uh, ocean going vessels. Uh, gas turbines, we're a leader in our size class for industrial gas turbines, everything from one to 30,000 horsepower. You know, the interesting thing about CAT and what really makes us successful is we have a, a portfolio of service businesses that are linked to the uh, core machine and engine business. So there's so cash flow after. We're one of the largest captive finance companies in the world. We really have a relationship with the customer who buys our machine, certainly for the first eight to 10 years, an intense relationship, and some relationship for maybe 20 to 30 years. 
And we have, uh, we're one of the largest industrial remanufacturers in the world. Uh, and we're in the locomotive and rail service business. We've just expanded in that in the last five or six years. So we really have a, a portfolio of highly related businesses. We've stuck to our netting, but yet we've sought growth opportunities where we think we can add a lot of value. Now, now when you took off that first year in your chair, things were good at Caterpillar. Uh, you know, uh, revenue was up 50%, profits were doubling. This was 2008, everything's booming. But you came out in 2007 with a prediction using your economic skills that there's a, res there's a downturn coming even though the, the, the world is doing pretty yeah. well. Let me, let me clarify that a little bit. First off, when we put our strategy, when I became CFO back in 93, yeah. one of the things I was very focused on is having our company get focused on never losing money in a downturn. And uh, we, we did uh, that in the early 90s, and that's the last time we have lost money or ever will, in my opinion. But we were viewed as a cyclical company. We had that uh, record. Uh, in the 80s, which was kind of our dark decade of losing money. The 90s was unfortunate because a huge investment that was just starting when we had a recession. So when I rolled out our strategy in 2004-05 and we were working on it, we had critical success factors. There's two of those that, you know, most of these are the kind of things you would expect in improving operational excellence. Two of the seven critical success factors have dealt with things a little unique. One was the key emerging markets. And we define this emerging market portfolio of countries as Russia, China, India, and the ASEAN group. And that's half the world's population, about half the natural resource base, half the energy consumption, and where most of our emergent competitors are coming up from. So we said we must lead there if we're going to be the global you leader. You have to win and, in the competitors. We have to win on the ground in that theater if okay. we're going to be the global leader in our business. And we are, we are about two to one the global leader in our business. And we're kind of number one or number two for every product line on every continent. But this is the, this is the hotbed of competition. This is the hotbed of growth, and we must lead there. The other critical success factor is I said we must grow our business in a way that allows us to sustain profitability in the event of the worst case scenario, which we define as a sort of a global meltdown a deep world recession that every country goes down simultaneously. Is, is that the trough strategy? That was our trough strategy. And we required each of our individual business units to look at the last 20 years of history and to say what happens, how do we sustain profitability at the unit level in the event of the worst drop that this business has experienced in 20 years? And we said if everyone can do that, we will survive nicely. And, you know, this was, uh, it looked like an idle exercise in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, as we had record results in my first five years in terms of sales and revenue and profit every year. But when late 2008, post Lehman Brothers came around, and we had to call the audible that uh, in our executive office that we're going over the cliff guys, you know, button down all the hatches, we asked everyone to fully implement their trough plans. We took out about 30% of our period cost structure in four months. And so we never had a, a, even a quarter of operating loss. We, were, we almost hit our, our 250 a share earnings target in 2009, even with a $19 billion drop in earnings, which nobody thought possible. So it was a pretty, uh, a great team effort, I would say. So this, this movie image of the chair CEO being a charismatic leader off in the corner, having this off the cuff, brilliant insight that saves a day. That's just fiction? That's fiction. It's just hard work and... Uh... It's hard work, it's preparation, it's thinking about all the possibilities and fully developing action plans for different scenarios that your business might logically have to deal with. Now part of this, for all companies, is everybody's trying to, to stay profitable, they're into uh, lower profits, lower revenues, and lower numbers of employees. You once said that a, that a great company, you can't be a great company if you're not a great employer. Is it possible to be a great employer even when you're doing cutbacks? Well, you know, for openers, everyone, the, the thrill of business is being able to hire. Yeah. But you've got to stay profitable over the long term in order to be an employer over the long term. Uh, 2000, you know, 2004 through 2008, we grew our employment from about 68,000 to close to 140,000. And I'm talking about all the people that we actually pay. Some of those were supplemental, contract, and temporary. We tried to do that because we needed to preserve the flexibility to adjust down. In 2009, our sales dropped $19 billion in the year. 
Uh, we went through a massive inventory correction globally. Uh, and we did that, we had to take out a lot of labor costs. And with that flexibility, we took about 35,000 people out worldwide. But, but that can be done humanely. It can be done. And this year, by the way, we're going to add more than 10,000 back. Great news. Worldwide. And, and that number is probably going to continue to grow as businesses continue to strengthen a little. So uh, there, there is hope in the future. There's absolutely hope in the future. And if you're successful in your business and you can grow your business, then you can add employment. Okay. You can't add employment if you don't have opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Jim. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk with Jim Owens about lessons learned during a remarkable career with Caterpillar. Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Jim Owens, Chairman of Caterpillar. Now, you're, you're retiring just a couple of three weeks after we record this episode. Um, let's look back, back a little bit. I mean, the company's, the company's been out there doing very well, uh, and it's been doing a lot of training uh, and development of the next generation of leaders. There's a new institute that's, that's named after you, a training center, leadership. Yeah. Institute. That's nice. Very proud of that. You should be. How, but let's talk about it personally. Throughout your career, how have you been able to help mentor the next generation of leaders coming up behind you and not be like the pontifical uncle? Well, I think, you know, leadership in, in really great companies is, if you get down to it, it's not about an individual. It's about a leadership culture. And we've worked hard at Caterpillar in recent years to go back and to uh, uh, work on leadership training and development with our senior team in the, the kind of meetings that we run and the selection of key people to go off for executive type of training periodically. But mainly it's, and also beginning to set the expectation, kind of a, a Noel Tishy guide here, of uh, having our leaders be teachers. So you know, I, I spoke to every Black Belt, Six Sigma Master Black Belt class for five years. Uh, you know, three, three graduating classes uh, per time. In 2009, interestingly, maybe enough to some, when the world was cascading down and we were not doing a lot of training, I set up a, a program where once a week I met with about 40 uh, black belts and master black belts who were driving some of the change initiatives that we had underway and just answered their questions and talked to them and tried to help them understand what we as a company were worried about and how as leaders, and this is maybe several levels down, they had a key role to play in keeping us on track and, and being prepared for the upturn, which will come, and which it did come in 2010, I'm happy to say. So, uh, and I developed a program, one of the programs I'm particularly proud of, called Leadership Quest, where we select uh, uh, about, for twice a year, about 30 of our most promising, high potential young executives from all over the world, bring them together, and have them in an intense one-week executive development program that's entirely taught by, our, well, I think maybe we have one or two outside speakers, but essentially entirely taught by our executive leadership team. And it, it runs the you know, full gamut of our strategy, our, you know, uh, where we're going, and it, it, it gets into a lot of basic management principles. And it really helps instill Caterpillar culture in people, it makes them feel like that they have a critical role as leaders to continue to learn and grow throughout their career. When you and I started our careers, we kind of had almost an expectation that we could probably stay with the one company through our whole career if we wanted to. The world has changed and now students graduating now aren't going to, maybe won't get to stay with one company their whole career or won't want to chair, stay uh, right. with the same company, different world. When when the people graduating now become chairs and CEOs of companies like Caterpillars, Caterpillar, are they going to lead differently because they've had all these different company experiences as opposed to someone who came up through the ranks like yourself? Yeah, I, I don't know. That may be the case. Uh, but first off, I think a lot of people are still staying with the same company, and we're very proud of the fact still that 
you know, sometimes we get people after they've had one or two other job experiences, but generally speaking, we're recruiting our, uh, at the project engineer, uh, accountant, uh, financial, we're not recruiting senior officers. We're growing them and we're developing them. And other people maybe try to hire them from us, but quite frankly, we're very much a promote from within company. We have uh, good talent within competing for about every job that opens up. And most of our employees are career employees, and we created a, a strong teaming culture. You know, I'm on the board at you know, IBM, another, I think, pretty good American company. I observe the same thing. Uh, they're not out hiring people from other companies at senior executive levels. They're growing their own, and they've got intense competition for promotions within. So I think if you're running a large company and you do it well, you will have people that want to stay and be an integral part of your team and will see opportunities to grow and continue to learn. I mean, I have worked for, as you pointed out, I've worked on three different continents. I've worked in multiple business units. I've had a variety of experiences. I've worked with different cultures. And the key is I, I learned all the way along through that journey. If I had just stayed in one place in one job, I, I, first off, I would never got to be the CEO. Now, I, look, I looked at the, uh, the company uh, figures for over your tenure in the, uh, in the chair CEO job. And it's been terrific. It's, like I said, it's been consistently profitable. There's long-term growth over the long curve. So beyond the financials, are there some things about your tenure as chair CEO that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to get remembered for terrific trough management, which I think we as a team pulled off remarkably well. But what I'd like to be remembered for is the people side of the equation. You know, we, when we laid out our critical success factors, and you mentioned it earlier, I've said many times, you just can't possibly be a great company without great people, great team, and with very high levels of engagement. So our, on our people critical success factor, I mean, we have leadership development and a lot of other metrics, but the top tier two metrics that I drove down through the organization were safety. We wanted to be, we, we had already made quite an improvement with Six Sigma Discipline. We'd come from mediocre to good. We set a goal to be one of the best four or five companies in the world for industrial safety. And we benchmarked all over to find out who they were. It's kind of Alcoa and DuPont. And we said, we want our reportable injury frequency and our lost time days to be as good or better than theirs by 2010. Wow. I'm very proud to say we're going to nail that. That was a, about an 85% improvement in both metrics across 300 plants worldwide. That, that tells people you're walking to talk on your values. You care about their health. The other thing we wanted on the people side was our employee surveys register how enthusiastic people are about working for us. You know, do you understand the goals and objectives? Do you feel like you're an integral part of making it uh, successful? Do your values count? Would you recommend this as a place for a friend to work? Uh, we've been in the low 50s, and our, some of our plants that had uh, union strife in the past in the 30s for positive feedback on our surveys. We said we'd like that to be 90. And of course, uh, most of our consultants said 60 would be good for a company of your size and complexity. And we said, no, you can't be a great company unless you're all working together. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that we came from the, the low mid-50s to 82 by the time we hit 2009, and that was a tough year. And it improved every single year. And as far as I know, we're in a stratosphere that no other large industrial multi-payroll uh, type company has ever achieved. So I'm very proud of that part. We have intensely communicated with people about what we're trying to achieve. We haven't met all of our goals. We had some goals for, for product quality and for uh, uh, growth and pull through that we didn't get all those goals. But you gotta get the foundations right. And you gotta have a great team. You gotta have people that work together and uh, who really embrace what you're trying to accomplish. And that gives you an opportunity to succeed long-term. I've got one last question for you, Jim. About two hours ago, we taped an episode of this show with your acquaintance, Roger Ferguson, yes. uh, President and CEO of TIA Craft. You and he both serve on the President's uh, Economic Ad Recovery Advisory Board. Right. You're both corporate CEO chair. You're both PhD economics. Let's assume tomorrow morning you and he flip jobs. How are you going to lead a financial uh, retirement planning company differently than you lead Caterpillar? Well, I used to run our benefit funds committee, so first off, I'd think about how do I deliver superior results for the people that invest in my fund. And I, uh, you know, I think Roger and TIA Kraft worked very hard on that, and, and 
I, I would get to know all the key people, think about our goals, objectives, be sure we're all working hard together with very high integrity to get those results delivered. Integrity counts in banks today. Integrity counts everywhere. Uh, no integrity, no company. And uh, so I, uh, that'd be my first order of business. Thanks for being here, Jim. My pleasure. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available on demand for viewing at DetroitPublicTV.org.